thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. I, I apologize in advance for speaking in English. Uh, my English is okay. My Spanish is much worse, you can trust me. So uh, this is the, the best language I have uh, uh, for now. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Mike Azenko. I'm a fellow in the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City. I work on a sort of range of U.S. foreign policy, international relations, and national security uh, topics from uh, the United Nations, where I spend a lot of my time dealing with conflict prevention, peacekeeping uh, issues, as well as uh, nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear uh, material security, um, mil U.S. military policy in Iraq and Afghanistan, and so forth as well as uh, conflict prevention issues, including uh, issue, the use of international institutions to prevent conflict, uh, gender-based violence, child protection, and a number of uh, similar issues. So um, there's a range of things that, uh, that I cover and I'm certainly happy to talk about later on during the question and answer session. Um, but I wanted to take a little time to do a little overview of the Obama administration's national security strategy. This is. In the United States, this is a fairly important document. It's, it's mandated by our parliament in order to um, provide an overview of what every incoming uh, administration aims to do in the, in the sphere of national security and foreign policy. It's, it's, been, it's been a requirement by law since the uh, mid-1980s after, if some of you know a little bit about the U.S. foreign policy history in the Reagan administration, the uh, situations in Central America and Lebanon were, uh, I would say, four uh, foreign policy outcomes. And Congress then mandated in 1986 that every year the uh, administration is supposed to produce what's called a national security strategy. This is supposed to be a concept, a comprehensive report that uh, assesses the US range of interests around the world. It's supposed to lay out the uh, goals and objectives and what are the capabilities on hand to do so, as well as any shortcomings within the uh, United States in order to achieve its uh, foreign policy objectives. So it's supposed to be produced every year. In reality, it's produced every four years. Um, it's also supposed to be, I learned um, looking at the original uh, legislation as the parliament ended, it's supposed to be a public document and then a classified version just for people within government. In reality, this, this document is just public. There is no classified version. There's just one version which you can go on the White House website and you find it was released in, in May of 2010. And, um, and it's what we see, you and I see, is the same thing that people in the United States uh, government with uh, top secret security clearances would see. Um, the, the national security strategy is a very, very carefully constructed uh, uh, strategy document. And the reason is, is that all of the agencies who are involved in U.S. foreign policy, this includes the uh, 16 agencies that make up the U.S. intelligence community, this includes the Department of Defense of the Pentagon, this includes the Department of State, uh, USAID, the primary um, development arm of the United States government, they all have some input in creating this, and they don't want to uh, have a document say anything that they're uncomfortable doing. And so it, it, takes, it took over uh, 18 months for the United States to create this document, but it finally, finally was produced in May. The, 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 the point of the document is to uh, put on the record for all of these different agencies, for the U.S. Uh, Parliament and for the public, uh, what it is that the United States intends to achieve under this uh, administration. Um, people might remember earlier national security strategies, the, the two famous ones released under President Bush, in 2002, which was a national security strategy that's uh, remembered primarily for um, making an explicit case for preventive use of military force, including unilaterally by the United States. And this was a, a sort of a sea change in US foreign policy to be so explicit about using force in a unilateral way. And then in 2006, the Bush administration released a second national security strategy. And this one is very famous for being open and overt in the promotion of uh, democracy. That democracy promotion is a is a key component of of uh, U.S. foreign policy, and so that was sort of a, a switch between the 2002 President Bush and 2006. Um, I want to go through through some of the big themes that appear in this 2010 Obama administration uh, uh, national security strategy. 
So the first uh, issue is what um, people call pragmatism, not realism. And the term is, you know, the, and President Obama uses, uses this focus all the time, which is we want to deal with the world as it is. And this is a, a um, explicit rejection of the impression within the Bush administration of what are, you know, what we call neoconservative thinking, which are people in the U.S. foreign policy uh, experts who picture the world as sort of wet clay, and they are sculptors. You know, the world it exists out there to be shaped and molded to meet U.S. national interests. Um, things like the, uh, the values, the objectives, the capabilities of other countries are not so important. What's important is what the United States wants to do, and the world can then go forward, can go forward and shape um, the rest of the world to meet its interests. And a lot of people uh, found this, not just in the world, but in the United States, found this very uncomfortable. It's a very uh, uh, sort of top-down um, directive to the rest of the world about how the world should exist. And that, uh, that is a, this is a clear repudiation of that. And part of this is another aspect of it of the strategy, which is that the U.S. now says, in the Obama administration, we will not impose any system of government on any other country. And the term they use for this is uh, respecting universal values, not necessarily promoting them. Uh, so this is another way of saying that the United States, uh, under the Obama administration, is not so interested in, in, uh, in, in, in exporting democracy or exporting democracy at the end of a gun, but is interested in respecting it where it exists. And, You've seen some of this in practice in the, in the United States, at least during the uh, election last year in Tehran, and uh, some, of the, um, uh, some of the protests after the Iranian um, national elections. There were many people in the United States, specifically from the former neoconservative community, who said, this, how can the Obama administration be so hands off? You know, these people are dying in the streets, fighting down uh, this government that is uh, undemocratic, that is stolen an election, that is run by uh, mullahs, and what we should do is support somehow uh, openly the, the people walking the streets. And the Obama administration said, no, this is not us for us to decide. And they were very hands off to the objection of a lot of, uh, of former Bush administration officials. And the, the primary reason the Obama administration is hands off is they have other objectives with Iran, specifically Iran's suspected nuclear weapons program. So in a sense, the at least in the case of Iran, this has been the, um, a situation where this is sort of has this, this has sort of played out. Another aspect of it is the issue of um, negotiating with Iran and North Korea. There's a famous line that um, Vice President Dick Cheney, when he was the Vice President, supposedly said, which is, "We don't negotiate with evil; we defeat it." And that's a very, uh, a very sort of objectionist view of how how to deal with the world if you, uh, you know, just in common international relations. And this uh, administration has uh, has um, has explicitly broken away from that. So the national security strategy says engagement with non-democratic regimes, uh, pursuing a dual-track approach to um, in which the United States can try to influence foreign governments, but is not looking to explicitly explicitly replace them because of the content of their of the regime that runs the country. And so this is a great uh, a great difference. And here again, we see. The negotiations with Iran, the attempts to restart, restart negotiations with North Korea, which have essentially been on hold since 2006, as a case of the Obama administration has somewhat done what it's uh, so it going to do. So that's one big theme, which is pragmatism, not realism, and dealing with the world as it is, and not necessarily trying to shape the world uh, as, as, as a sculptor. The, the second big issue, which is important to the United States domestically, is a commitment to renew the American economy. Um, which to a lot of people serves as sort of the, um, the foundation of U.S. Uh, foreign policy, the foundations of U.S. military power. Uh, the United States since, you know, like many other parts of the world since 2007, 2008, has been a, a significant financial crisis. Um, the uh, unemployment in the United States is about 10%, which for Spain is low, but the United States is a uh, high since the early 1980s, and it's the longest time Unemployment has been this high since the Great Depression. In certain um, states, which will be very important to the U.S. elections next week in the Midwest and in the far south, unemployment is over 15%. Um, there's very low GDP growth. Uh, it's, it's expected to be less than 2% this year. Uh, the, last year was the first year of negative growth after two years of essentially flat policy. The United States is also massively, massively in debt. 
Uh, the U.S. debt right now is uh, $13.7 trillion, it's trillion with a T. Uh, it's roughly 75-80% of the United States GDP, and it's expected to just go up exponentially because, in part because of the um, social welfare state programs, and primarily because the Political parties in the United States cannot work together to find a solution. They have no reason to. They're not. They're not interested in doing it. So the financial situation is getting worse. Um, it's more than a threat to the economy uh, and a threat to U.S. foreign policy. It's also a key domestic political issue. Um, everything that the White House does, whether it's environmental policy, whether it's climate change, and U.S. foreign policy, you have to have a uh, sensitivity to the economic suffering of, the, of people. And so. This uh, national security strategy, in a way that none had in the past, makes the key point that investment in uh, U.S. Uh, infrastructure, education, science, and technology are essential components of the building blocks of uh, U.S. foreign policy. So that's the second big uh, uh, framing issue, which is a commitment to the economy as the foundations of U.S. foreign policy. Um, a third big framing point is what they call reorienting foreign policy. And this is a... Um, essentially a, uh, a recognition of the limits, of the huge limits of, of uh, U.S. of uh, military power. Uh, the current Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert Gates, has made a number of speeches since he came into office in 2006 where he says, you know, the military by default is dealing with a lot of problems in the world, in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's the primary interlocutor in uh, Pakistan. In a large part, the reason for this happening is that the, um, the State Department in the United States, which is supposed to be the foreign policy, uh, is supposed to run foreign policy in the United States, and USAID, which is the lead development agencies, are very much smaller institutions in the military. To give an example, the, the, there are more people in military marching bands. So the US military has all these bands. The Marines, the Army, the Navy, they have bands. They play instruments. They have orchestras. There are more people in bands for the U.S. military than there are foreign service officers who work for the State Department. It's something like 6,000 to 7,000 foreign service officers, and there are more people in bands. There are USAID, which is supposed to be the development agency in the United States, has something like four to five to 6,000 people. The U.S. military just is the active duty, so this is not the people in the, in the reserves in the United States, has 2.2 million people. It, the military has a budget of about $630 billion. The State Department has a budget of about $55 billion. So there is a, an enormous skew, uh, a split in the, in the dedication of resources. So there has been a, a big um, focus within this uh, national security strategy to reorient um, a lot of the money and attention and uh, personnel that have been spent in the military in the past to more uh, traditional U.S. foreign policy issues within the, specifically the State Department, um, USAID. So that's a, another big sort of another big component of this strategy.